We're going to talk today about Battle Royal, the short story by Ralph Ellison. So we're going to begin first by talking about the social and historical context of this story. This story was written uh, against the backdrop of the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, the civil rights movement would become really famous in the 60s with leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Um, but this story was written maybe 10 or 15 years before those people became famous. And stories like this um, were some of the cornerstones that really began the movement. Uh, Ellison was, uh, like Langston Hughes and several other writers, a member, an official member, I guess, of the Harlem Renaissance. And what the Harlem Renaissance was during the uh, early uh, to mid-1900s, we'll say 1920 to 1950 or so, um, there was a, a new energy among African-American writers, artists, and musicians to create things that represented their experiences. And it so happened that these artists began to congregate in the Harlem borough of New York City. And so they all kind of had a community and knew each other and were working towards this common goal of creating a body of work that represented their struggles in the United States. Um, and so this story was part of that movement. Uh, what you're reading with uh, this story, Battle Royal, is actually the first chapter of a novel called The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison that won numerous awards and is a very famous novel. It's often on the banned books list if you're interested in banned books. Um, the point of view of the story is in the first person. So we are the main character. We are in his head. He does not name himself, but calls himself an invisible man, which is how we will refer to him going forward. Notice that this story is told in flashbacks. So we have a narrator who is presumably grown and um, in later stages of adulthood, but is looking back on himself as an 18-year-old boy. And this is interesting because we have the wisdom of the older man against the naivety of the young man. Um, and we'll see that kind of come in and out as we go. We mentioned in an early uh, portion of this module that first person narrators are unreliable. And remember, that doesn't mean that we can't count on them. Unreliable in this case means that because of their own limitations or prejudices or opinions, uh, there's always going to be a little bit of a gap between what they, the way they describe things and the way things actually are. For example, you'll notice that the young man in the story believes uh, all the way to the end that he has been brought to this location to give a graduation speech and to be honored. And he continues to believe this even as he's being disrespected, abused, hollered at, made to feel stupid, all of these things. He naively believes that he is being uh, honored. Um, now we know that's not true as the reader, so we can see that he is an unreliable narrator uh, and we can see things that he can't see. Uh, and then notice as well, this is where that, that narrator who is the grown man looking back, uh, the grown man looking back can see that he was being treated badly. So we have a sense of, I wish I had, had known better than to say something. Uh, but of course the 18 year old boy does not realize uh, the position he's in. Some overall themes of this story, some of these might be more obvious than others. This is clearly a story about racial inequality in the period leading up to the civil rights movement. Uh, you can see that um, because we're coming near civil rights, you do have the bo this boy, the main character, the Invisible Man, and boys like him exceeding in school and at least on the surface being congratulated for that. So there's a picture of equality, like a, uh, a ruse of equality, but, of course, uh, we can see in the actions of the powerful white men that uh, equality is just a, a word to them. And they want to make sure that they keep this young black boy in his place. Um, there's also a theme throughout the story about wearing masks. And we'll get into this more in, in coming slides. But uh, we're talking about a metaphorical mask. So uh, the idea that we can present ourselves one way but have something else going on on the inside. 
You can think about the way that ducks look very calm above water, but underneath the water their feet are furiously flipping back and forth. Uh, in the same way, this story is full of people who present one self or one face to the public uh, while kind of harboring some different and conflicting things behind that mask. And finally, as we've already mentioned, this is a story about the naivety of youth. So as, as children and young adults, we are so ready to believe that everybody is on our side and that everybody is, uh, is by, their, by their nature, a good person. And of course, as we grow older, we become disillusioned and, and cynical and we realize that this is not true. So what we're seeing here in Battle Royal is kind of the moment where this boy begins to realize at last that not everybody is on his side. Uh, some symbols and important ideas. I mentioned wearing masks and I wanted to give you some specific examples about that. Look at that grandfather's advice that he gives uh, his son and grandson. This is at the beginning of the story. Son, after I'm gone, I want you to keep up the good fight. I never told you, but our life is a war and I have been a traitor all my born days a spy in the enemy's country ever since I give up my gun back in the Reconstruction. Live with your head in the lion's mouth. I want you to overcome them with yeses, undermine them with grins, agree them to death and destruction, let them swallow you whole till they vomit or bust wide open. Now, a lot of people read this advice as, you know, be a, a good, agreeable person. So the best way to get ahead in life is to is just to go along with these white people and say yes to them and grin at them and agree with them and so forth. But notice how this passage starts. I want you to keep up the good fight. So the grandfather is telling his son and his grandson to keep pushing back and fighting against inequality. But he's not saying do it outright, so don't go and charge in there and fight. He's saying fight by agreeing with them and staying you know, like a spy in the enemy's country. Um, so he's saying, wear a mask, wear this agreeable, kind mask, and that way they'll welcome you in so that from the inside you can begin to resist them. So the grandfather is telling his son and grandson, you're going to have to appear calm, docile, peaceful, uh, say yes and agree and grin, but on the inside, keep resisting and keep fighting. And by, you know, this grinning and, and agreeing, that's, that's what allows them to stay safe and alive. Um, but the grandfather is saying, don't let that be who you really are. Make sure that's just a mask you're wearing. Also notice the description of the dancer. It says, her hair was yellow like that of a circus cupie doll, the face heavily powdered and rouged as though to form an abstract mask, the eyes hollow and smeared a cool blue, the color of a baboon's butt. And later he says, they caught her just as she reached a door raised her from the floor and tossed her as a college boy is tossed at a hazing. And above her red, fixed smiling lips, I saw the terror and disgust in her eyes, almost like my own terror. I want to point out a couple of things to you about this. First of all, notice that she's described as wearing a mask. Her makeup is, is kind of like a mask. So her, her real humanity is being covered up by these over-the-top cosmetics. Notice, secondly, that in the second passage I gave you here, it said that they were tossing her in the air like you would at a hazing, and above her red, fixed smiling lips, so her smile is not genuine, it's like fixed on, he says, I saw the terror and disgust in her eyes, almost like my own terror. Uh, so he can see that behind her face, her fixed mask-like face, there is terror behind there. So she has to wear a mask too and pretend just like he does to be agreeable uh, and to go along with it. I also, I didn't include this quote for you, but I want to point out to you that there is a passage where the boy has some really conflicting feelings towards the woman. He says, you know, he, he's really attracted to her and he wants to, to you know, grab her in his arms and and um, that kind of thing in a sexual way, but he says he also just kind of hates her and he wants to, you know, uh, do violence towards her. He doesn't want to look at her anymore. And I always ask students, why do, you, why do you think that this is true? Remember that this woman has not been brought out to entertain the boys. She's been brought out to humiliate them. Uh, she's been brought out to uh, force them into arousal so that they can be made fun of uh, and, and humiliate them. Um, 
And so the boy, in one way, is aroused by her, but he also realizes the humiliation of the moment. And so uh, he's angry with her for making him, you know, uh, bring him to this humiliation in front of these, these people he wants to impress. But he also says he wants to cover her up and protect her. And that is probably because they are both being victimized by the same group of men, and they both feel terror and disgust. Notice he says her terror mirrors his terror. So they're both being victimized by the same group of people. Um, finally, I want to bring your attention to the dream that the boy has at the end, which is very significant. The boy at the end dreams that he is at the circus with his grandfather. And I want to remind you of all of the circus imagery that you've seen throughout the story. Uh, we, there was the image of the head and the lion's mouth, which is something that happens at a circus. The girl is dressed up like a circus cupid doll. Uh, and then the boy's fighting like animals. And so finally, the boy has a dream that he's actually at a circus. And his grandfather is there too, but notice that his grandfather refuses to laugh at the clowns. So if you imagine that up until this point, the boy thought, I'm going to perform for these men. I'm going to say yes and gr agree and grin and say my speech and all of those things. Um, the grandfather is saying uh, in this dream, you know, you were performing like a clown and I'm not going to laugh at the clowns. So don't perform for these people. Right, so get out of this idea of, of being a good boy and, and pleasing the crowd. Notice also very significantly that inside the dream briefcase, uh, in the real briefcase, of course, there was a scholarship to an all-black college that the boy is happy to receive. But in the dream briefcase, uh, there is an envelope, and instead of being filled with a scholarship, it's just filled with more envelopes that go on and on uh, almost forever. And then finally on the inside, a note that says, keep this boy running. So imagine that these two briefcases and their contents are uh, equated, sat next to each other. Uh, in a way, they are the same thing. So in the one briefcase, you have these, these never-ending envelopes that are just supposed to keep the boy busy and uh, keep him from being a threat. In the other envelope, you have the scholarship to school. Now imagine for a moment why these white men would try to befriend or do a favor for this black boy. They know that he is very intelligent, uh, and often the thing that, that brings down oppression is intelligence. It's a very intelligent person, like, for instance, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. And so to prevent this boy from becoming that leader, uh, these men are trying to keep him in their pocket, keep control of him, keep him running. So the dream briefcase is kind of a, a representation of what the real briefcase is. It's just a way to keep him busy instead of focusing on who his enemy is. Which brings me to the final symbol I want to point out to you, which is the white blindfold. So before the boys are permitted to box, they are made to fight wearing white blindfolds. And this is significant. We mostly think of blindfolds as being black or a dark color. These blindfolds are white. Um, so the boys are blindfolded. Uh, so that they won't know who their enemies are. Uh, they're made to feel that their enemies are the other boys in the ring, but who are their real enemies? Their enemies are these men out in the crowd jeering and humiliating them and trying to keep control of them. So these white blindfolds are a symbol for the white control of these black boys. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, you'll notice that our, our hero here, the Invisible Man, slips his blindfold up just a little bit and begins to peer out the bottom so he can get a better idea of what's going on. And, and that kind of signifies the rest of his journey. He will slowly start to take the blindfold off and understand uh, that he has been wronged. Which brings us back to that theme also of the naivety of youth. So in youth, uh, we might permit ourselves to be blindfolded, but as adults, we want to see what's really there, whether or not we like what we see. I hope that you got something out of this story and found it useful, and as always, you're welcome to email me or message me with any questions that you have.